Welcome all, Steve Parisi here with IBC Global this morning. Hope you are having a fantastic day. So today we've got our good friend here, Denzel, Denzel Rodriguez. How you doing, Denzel? Hello, sir. Another fantastic morning. Thank you for having me again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Always a pleasure to connect with you. Well, today uh, you and I were talking a little bit. We've got a great topic uh, which blends what you do, velocity banking and then infinite banking, how those two can work beautifully together, but really what to know before starting. How do I approach the situation if I've got a lot going on, which frankly everyone does in one way or another. <laughs> how do I, yeah, how do I approach the situation rather than just jumping into a strategy? Because I, if I hear that velocity banking or infinite banking or high cash value life insurance policy has worked wonders for someone, okay, I like it. I like what I can do with it. I want it, but it doesn't accommodate my situation at, at the present moment. Okay, what do I need to know first? Whether I'm a self learner, I'm going to do research on my own, or if I'm talking to someone like you or us or me or another professional out there, the stuff to know first so you can take those right steps and then just go a mile a minute. So uh, today you wanted to start off with an actual case study, right? Some real numbers that you have where we can kind of walk through the initial steps and then we'll talk about each detail there as far as how to approach an individual situation or, or this specific case and then some recommendations, how we can actually blend policy structure and such into it. Um, but why don't we why don't we dive in if you want to lay out the foundation of the case and we'll we'll have some fun. Definitely. Yeah. So we'll we'll just jump right into it. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, share my screen here. Mm -hmm. All right. So the reality of the situation for I would say majority of Americans, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, you know, less than five thousand in your savings account. Your four hundred one k is going up. It's going down. You don't know what you're getting charged. You know, got to worry about taxes. You got to worry about high cost of goods, mortgage payments, debt payments, low cash flow. There's, there's, you know, people's finances, majority of people I work with that initially find information regarding velocity banking, infinite banking, high cash value life insurance, 10 X in your income, all these wonderful concepts that are proven to work. The issue is how do I, add these things properly into my pre-existing finances, the way I've been doing things already, how do I just position myself so that when I'm talking to an expert like Steve Parisi, when I'm talking to a life insurance agent or a financial consultant like myself and an agent as well, to make sure that I don't just, you know, get sold into something. I don't, uh, fall into the concept thinking the concept is going to save me from my financial stress. I would actually argue that there are these initial disciplines that we want to put in place first. There's these, you know, initial, um, you know, just fundamental principle rules that we want to simply have in place. And, you know, just laying out just some qualifications here that I like to normally see with an individual is I like to see good income. What is good income? You know, I, I would say anything above the, uh, the average in the U S which I think is between five and 6,000 a month, you know, and then anything above that is, is, you know, to me is good income. Yeah. Um, there's, certain case study I have here where I have a couple husband and wife together making uh, a little over 11 grand a month. So that's good income, right? The next thing I like to see is um, cash flow. And a lot of people get this word really confused. Cash flow just simply means the amount of money that's left over after all, and when I say all, I mean all, after all your bills are paid, all your debt payments, all your living, miscellaneous, all your giving, your tithing, your investing, your saving. So if you're saving money, that's an expense. 
It's money that you're putting off to the side over here. If you're investing, that's an expense. You're putting money off to the side over here. What's left over is free cash flow, money that doesn't go anywhere at the end of the month. What's that number? Me, I usually like to see $1,500 or more, mm -hmm. right? I also like to see capital. Like how much do you have in savings? How much do you have in your 401k and different assets? What's liquid? What's not? What can we use? What are you willing to use to either do velocity banking or do infinite banking or do both? Right. So capital, um, you know, obviously I would say low expenses or, you know, proportionate to what you make. Like if you make 11 grand and you spend 11 grand that, you know, to me would automatically disqualify you for velocity banking and infinite banking. It's like, where is the free money? How are we actually going to, you know, fund this policy? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always have creative things that I do to, you know, start policies and things like that, but I don't want people to get sold into that idea that, oh, I can do it. And it's like, wait a second, let's, let's learn the stuff first. Let's get positioned right. Okay. So low expenses. Then I also like to see good credit. Right. Um, what I mean by that is just your ability to access either a line of credit, a HELOC credit cards, some additional leveraged capital that we could potentially use, obviously for velocity banking, and in some cases for infinite banking. Right. So these are some of the qualifications that I like to see. Now let's look at a real case. And what I did was I dated it from the, the very first time we started, I started working with this client. And then just up till today, we're now, uh, it's October 30th, right? So we're like the last, last couple of days for the month ends and then we're heading into November. Gotcha. So we're going to go back a little bit and I'm just going to show you the reality of people's numbers. And this will be really uh, helpful and kind of just, you know, bring you back down to earth say, all right, the concept is great. I know it can work. I just need to give myself time. Maybe that's six months. Maybe it's a year, right? And don't have FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Oh, right. Denzel, but I'm 55. I'm getting older. And it's like, whoa, wait, wait. You know, let's, let's take it reasonably. What are the most important things in your personal finances that need to get done? And then what can we add along the way? So the four major numbers, Steve Parisi always talks about the four major mutual <laughs> life insurance companies. I always talk about your four major numbers. What are they? That's your income, expenses, debt, and cash flow. So for this uh, couple here, they're making in uh, in uh, July they were making eleven thousand two hundred forty-two dollars and nine cents. Their expenses ten thousand five hundred forty-two dollars and nine cents. That right there is a red flag. Yeah. Their cash flow seven hundred dollars. Another red flag. Don't like it. Their debt. They got a lot of debt. Right. Five hundred and Forty-three thousand two sixty-nine oh six. Um, that's another thing that I would add here is I usually like to see people with no debt, right, or some debt. And what I mean by some debt is you know maybe like a mortgage and a car, but not like a mortgage, two cars, personal loans, student loans, credit card debt, debt consolidation loan, personal loan, solar power loan. Like you, you're just like whoa, wait, way too much going on. So either no debt or some debt, like maybe one or two liabilities that aren't really killing you in your finances and you're still netting a high cash flow, then, you know, we're good. But in this case, we've got three red flags already. Expenses, debt, cash flow. He has good income, but he spends a lot and he has a lot of debt yeah. and he has low cash flow. Now here's a green flag. He's got cash on hand, $30,000. Not bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another green flag is he does have good credit. So he does have what's called a personal unsecured revolving line of credit for 30 grand at 11.25%. Simple interest calculated daily. Okay. And then he also has um, credit cards, right? Really good credit cards with um, 
averaging about 2.5% in cashback rewards. And uh, when I work with my clients, I love to use credit cards to run bills that can be paid with a credit card and I get cashback rewards. I don't pay interest. So basically I'm, I'm running a portion of this 10,000 in his case, four to $6,000 out of his 10 that he spends per month are bills that can be paid with a credit card. And what he does between like one or two different cards is he just runs it, runs the bills, pays it off in full on the due date. And he'll get an average of 2.5% in cash back per month, right? So if I went with the low number, 4,000 times 2.5%, it's a hundred bucks. That's $1,200 a year. It's money he was gonna spend anyways. I'm just running it through a credit card. It builds his credit up, gets him access to more capital in the future. And you know, it's just one of those, like it makes sense. And, you know, to demystify, oh, you know, these credit cards and the banks, they're all set up to be against you. Not necessarily if you understand how to properly use these things, just like how to properly structure a life insurance policy. 100%. It, it, you know, it's not necessarily the product that went bad. It's the user and the seller, I would say, right? Agreed. So, you know, one, one cool thing to know with credit cards is they act, credit card companies make more money, not on the interest that they charge us, but the actual use of the credit card. Like, for example, American Express, when you swipe it at other locations, those locations have to pay merchant fees Correct. to hold American Express mm -hmm. because the social system have made, we've made sense of using a plastic card instead of cash. Mm -hmm. So if your store doesn't accept American Express, you're losing profits. So you say, all right, I'm going to pay American Express this so I can get more profit here. So by you using the credit card properly, never pay any interest, it's a win-win. The client, me, I win because I get cash back rewards. I never pay interest. The bank wins because they're making money whether I paid interest on it or not. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's something really, really cool to know. A lot of people don't know about that. Beautiful. Um, now, Another fundamental thing, whether I'm doing velocity banking, infinite banking, or none, increase cash flow, right? Increase cash flow, just cut back on wasteful spending is something that this couple uh, is doing in addition to uh, preparing for velocity banking. Okay. Right? So those are the four major numbers. What's the next thing we got to look at? The debts, mm -hmm. right? We got to break down all the debts. So I won't go through all of the numbers here, but I'll yeah. just show it so that you guys can see it. But you can see the major debts, mortgage, car, loan, right? Student loans, other loans, credit cards. He's all over the place. Yeah. Right. This is an indication. So if I'm a life insurance agent, it's nice to get these numbers from my clients. So, so I don't waste my time. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I don't want to entertain infinite banking to this person if I know they're not ready for it and they, you know, they may have just said, Oh yeah, Denzel, I got 30 grand. I want to throw this into infinite banking. Let's go. Yeah. And you're like, well, okay. Now as an insurance agent, what's nice is we get to, you know, we have the right, you know, to ask this mm -hmm. personal information about our clients. You know, we get to, we get to ask those questions, yeah. you know, openly. Mm -hmm. And, and in most cases, usually I've never had a problem getting all these figures because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's going to help my commission. It's going to help retain that client from getting buyer's remorse. Correct. And they're going to send me their entire family. Yep. If mm -hmm. I help them, you know, according to their, their figures, their numbers, sure. not just selling them a dream of right. infinite banking, you know? Mm -hmm. So those are the, the, the breakdowns of all the debts. Now we're going to go into, okay, well, the concept Right, everybody's so excited about velocity banking, they want to get started right away and do all this crazy stuff. So, um, one of my rules that I like to have when I'm leveraging debt, right? I'm using debt to pay debt. In other words, I'm borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Now, I don't borrow from Peter to pay Paul like most Americans do. 
where they borrowed from Peter to pay Paul off and then they refinanced through Peter to pay off Paul. So now they just have a new loan, right. a new interest rate, and a new low monthly payment. Mm -hmm. No. What we do in Velocity Banking is we take from Peter at 0% cost, mm -hmm. we pay off Paul, get cash flow gain, interest savings, and then we dump all our income into Peter, right? And we start paying him off extremely fast. So that's what we're doing here in this case. So this word chunk simply means the amount of money I took from Peter, right? And what I'm gonna pay towards Paul. So when I'm borrowing from Peter, my rule is I only borrow 66% of what Peter is giving me. Or in this case, in modern society, Bank of America, Chase, right. Wells Fargo, the banks, the credit unions, right? What are they, what are they um, giving me? So in his case, we've got that $30,000 PLOC at the 11.25%. Mm -hmm. um, so we got, you know, 30 grand times 66% is 19,800. Now this person is new. So with his cash flow only being $700, mm -hmm. The next thing that I do to determine what our chunk is going to be is I take his cash flow, I times it by 12 throughout the whole year, mm -hmm. right? So seven times 12 is $8,400. Now, why do I do this? I do this because I need to justify borrowing from Peter to pay Paul in the first place. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing that instead of just sending my $700 towards my smallest debt and you know, doing it the traditional right. way of doing things. I have to make sure that I'm actually going faster than the traditional way. If I do not run numbers, you know, I'm I'm gonna be in a mess, right? right. Or that means I got sold into the concept and mm -hmm. I'm just doing it Truthfully. when I could have just been doing it simply yeah. and got the same results. Mm -hmm. So in his case, um, we paid off some high interest credit cards. You know, pretty much all of the things that we paid off were higher than 11.25. So that right there justifies it. That's simply debt consolidation. But now we're gonna accelerate that by simply dumping all our income into the line of credit because we have the ability to do that. It's a revolving line of credit. So between 8,400 and then 66%, which was um, 19,800, yep. between those two numbers would be our chunk amount. Okay. Now. Because he has high income, it also makes sense to go higher than his cash flow times 12, but not too high, like the 66%. So we actually was like dollar for dollar. Our first chunk was 17,971.75. He increased his cash flow by 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. Also saved money on interest and He's also reducing his cost of living and redirecting cash flow. He cut off contributions to his 401k. You know, he, he's starting to get control of all of his cash flow of okay. his money. With he's you. putting the power back into his hands. Mm -hmm. So that was the first chunk. Now we had another conversation. So fast forward from July. Now we're in October 14th, right? We're recording this on October 30th. Mm -hmm. So October 14th, here are his new numbers. So can I interject real quick? Sure. Question. So when you took that first chunk out, <clears throat> yeah. increased his cash flow by 500 bucks plus. So now his monthly cash flow is about 1200 per month. So it was 700 pl plus the 500. So you're at 1200 that I'm assuming you're redirecting towards the line. Correct. Personal line um, of credit and the repeat, rinse repeat. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So nice. what happens is that 17971 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. between July and October, it hit zero. Yep. Now, how is that possible? Because yeah. he's only cash flowing $1,200. Well, in his case, um, because he also redirected cash flow, so that boosted him up to like almost 2000 He reduced his cost of living. Sure. He's also using those credit cards, getting cash back rewards. And then he also had a bonus that came in. So we did get a bonus. Um, and usually you. when there's 
any and all additional income that comes in, I throw it right into the line, right into the line of credit. I want to get that wiped out as fast as humanly possible so I can go ahead and make my next chunk towards the next debt and start really creating a lot of momentum here or AKA velocity, right? So as of October, his income is now, it went up a little bit. So it's 11,401.92. His expenses dropped to 9,398.57. Now the debt, um, it, looks, it looks like I made a mistake here. So I think I might've made a mistake. So between 543, I might have left out one of his business debts because yeah. he, he is a business owner. I so I that. think I think I might have laid out all the personal. Mm -hmm. So technically, he's even even more debt. He's gotcha. technically e even in more debt, right? So mm -hmm. 723, 897, 86. So that's yeah. a mistake on my end. No, I forgot I to display that. The business but <laughs> nonetheless, still, like you're not ready. <laughs> mm -hmm. This guy's got a lot of debt. So, but look at this. Cash flow went up. Sure, up to two thousand. Yeah, and there's more. There's more to it. Cause just because my observation for anyone um, listening or watching, because we've got the screen share up here, is we were at seven hundred. You freed up five hundred, which is twelve hundred. So now you're at two thousand per month. But kind of what you added in, in there, you had a bonus, other sources of expenses. Um, you more or less alleviated by just making some adjustments to lifestyle, simplifying a little bit. Right. And that contributed to that increase. Where now that's where a jump came from two thousand from seven hundred to two thousand. Exactly, and that's also through just your conversation and consulting with him. Um, because naturally, I would have a question on that too. But I mean, that that is part of the value you have there as far as the education process. Where else can we save to move fast, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm taking all of the traditional, you know basic fundamental things i do not discount those things mm -hmm. so you know we're we're not making we're not doing any magic here right <laughs> so we're we're taking that traditional stuff but then we're just adding some velocity to it leverage mm -hmm. right now another thing that occurred in this person's finances if i come up here to the um his uh personal mortgage i forgot which month it began but because of covid he was able to um, put this on voluntary forbearance where he does not pay this 2,877 Okay. So that is technically a temporary cash, cash flow. flow gain, mm -hmm. right? Which also helped him pay down the line of credit extremely fast. And then his student loan also is on forbearance. I think both of these actually are on forbearance. So that's okay. 230, 27, 429, 65. And they're not accruing interest. Um, the mortgage does accrue interest, but the payments will just get put on the back end of the mortgage. So he will not have to, you know, pay a bunch of payments when the mortgage kicks back in. He'll just go back to paying 287767. Okay. Gotcha. So these are some other additional things that really, really helped him out. Uh, to pay that line of credit extremely fast, like this, like less than three months, right? From yeah. July to October, so about three months. Okay. So now October, we had a conversation. It was on this date and we said, okay, line of credit's at zero. What do we do? We got to make another chunk, right? But we also have to keep in mind of all the other things that are going on, right? He's got these forbearance things that are going to kick back in um, January. So his mortgage is in forbearance till January. So how do I maximize that 2,877.67 elsewhere, pay off debt, try and get cash flow gain, interest savings, and then just come back right. to the mortgage? Is that a possibility? So the answer is yes. We um, technically, the his, his true cash flow is 2,000. Three dollars thirty-five cents, but temporarily, for October and moving forward, he's actually at five thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars and forty-two cents. Okay. When you factor in redirecting cash flow, paying off some debt, mortgage forbearance, student loan forbearance, we're not making payments, so that's money that sits in the line of credit. 
temporary amount, the cash temporary. flow through January. Exactly. <clears throat> so this now authorizes me to increase my chunk amount. As you can see, we came up with a number of 25,976.67, which pays off a debt consolidation loan that he had in full. And when you run the math, he saves $5,366.73 of interest alone. And he gains $614.40 in cash flow. So if we come back up to the debts here, and you ask yourself, Denzel, why you chose, why did we choose that instead of something else? Right? Why not go with the smaller debts and work your way up? Right. So this has to do with my my thinking is how do I gain the most amount of cash flow first, interest savings second. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might alternate between the two, but priority is usually always cash flow. We're in a pandemic, COVID, we got elections going on, um, unemployment rates. There's always something going on in the social society. Right. So between that economy and my personal economy, cash flow is the number one thing that separates me from everyone else that's going through crisis and then my own personal economy. Mm -hmm. If my own personal economy has cash flow, no matter what's going on out there, it does not affect what's going on in here, in Great. his household. Yep. Right. So now figuring out, okay, why go with the, the loan? Right. What, why, why do that? Why do we pick that? So just going one by one, the mortgage simply it's too big yeah. to go after right now. Doesn't make any sense. Plus it's in forbearance. Why would I yeah. pay extra towards that? I'm not, I'm not going to put my money to the best use. Okay. Next thing is he has a car. If I'm not mistaken. I think it's a Tesla or it's, it's a Mercedes a nice it's car. ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Expensive car, you know, dude's in debt. So this is typical American stuff. So he's paying 92408. I forgot what the interest was. I didn't get a chance to put that in there, but I think it's like maybe four or 5%. Right. But again, way too big to tackle for right now. Mm -hmm. Moving along the line, student loan forbearance, no need. 113,000. That's ridiculous. Don't even try that. For the amount of cash flow you get, uh, yeah. it's not even worth it, mm -hmm. right? It's also in forbearance. 10000 25 bucks a month. That's ridiculous. I wouldn't throw my money there. It doesn't make sense. Loan, it's 323.03. Very attractive, but it's at 0%. Yeah. I'm not going to borrow from Peter. Peter's charging me interest. Paul isn't. So it's reversed. Why would I borrow from Peter if he's going to charge me interest to pay Paul, who's not charging me interest? Right. It doesn't make sense. The next one, the loan also had zero. This loan also had zero. This credit card also had zero. We've got two credit cards, one at 8.9% simple interest. And this one is at 12.24 simple interest. Both of these do not make sense to go after number one because the 8.9 is less than his debt tool, 11.25. That would be a cost difference. Now, if this 8.9% was amortized, this is another key factor here, knowing the difference between amortized and simple interest. If it was amortized, it might have been attractive. But because it's simple interest, the way the payment is calculated is very different. It's usually with credit cards, one or 2% of the balance. So for me to dedicate 4,000 to only get 100, right? And then another seven to only get two, that's three. That's, you know, that's like a seven, four, 11. That's like a $12,000 chunk just to get three. Gotcha. Whereas if I did 25, I get 614. And then, yep. you know, when I was running the math, it just, you know, anything else that you add, you're not going to really pay off. Sure. If you do pay off these, you're actually costing yourself, right? So you, you, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So that's why we went with that second chunk, right? And so here's what it looks like when you 
take money out of line of credit, put money in and all that good stuff. So the line of credit in October goes up to as high as 25,976.67. He consolidated an amortized 10.49% to 11.25. Now, if you're like, wait a minute, Denzel, that's higher. Does that make sense? Remember, it's an amortized loan. He's got 51 payments left on it. Mm -hmm. And he's got exactly this amount of interest on it. Right. So all I'm doing is getting rid of that. And I'm going to pay pennies on the dollar with this money in the line of credit. Is that clear? Yep. I follow you. So now we have to justify, right? We can't just say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. No, we need to run the numbers. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. So his income throughout 30 days, I think he gets paid biweekly. And then his wife, I think, is also biweekly. So we got like four checks coming in per month. And then I think there's some um, income from the business or salary. I forget how he, how he does it. But um, income, all of this goes into here. So that means that 25967 and 67 cents, right? Times 11.25%, right? And then when you divide that to, you know, what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to understand what's my borrowing cost? Mm -hmm. What's my net borrowing cost, right? So take that number times it by 11.25. You're going to get $2,900 and some change. Take that number divided by 365. You're going to pay eight bucks a day. Pay eight dollars a day, but the minute I take out that twenty five thousand, I'm actually going to make that chunk on the day that he has the majority of this income, and typically that's on payday. So the minute I take out twenty five, I'm dumping like fifty percent of his income right back into the line of credit, so I don't even get charged the eight dollars on the first day. It'll be more like maybe seven or six or five or four, like it's going to be less, right? So the balance is going to be as low as 14574 once all income has gone in. And then here are his expenses going out, right? Considering everything that we did, and we also got this 61440 cash flow. He paid it off before the payment showed up. Right. So it's, we don't even have to worry about it for the month of October. So he gets that cash flow uh, instantly. Gotcha. It sits in the line of credit. So it doesn't go anywhere. It's not being, uh, we're not losing it. Yeah. So it goes, so the line of credit is as high as the chunk, as low as what my total income goes in. And then it comes back up to 20,481.25. And when you do the math, you take these three numbers, the 14, the 20, the 25, and do the, the formula I just said, times it by 11.25 divided by 365, see what your daily rate is. You get, you get three numbers, add those three numbers up, divide it by three, right? And then times that number by 30 days. Okay. Your average cost of borrowing in the first month is $188. Now, I know for a fact that out of that 61440, a good probably two hundred dollars or less was coming from that. Mm -hmm. So I pay 188 in the line of credit in the first month, but now we also have to factor in what is he doing with those credit cards? Remember those credit cards? Mm -hmm. So I wrote that he's getting an average of $125 a month in cash back rewards by swiping four to six grand. Okay. And what you have to realize is if I'm swiping the credit card throughout the month to pay these bills, that's even less money that actually leaves the line of credit. So that means this 188 is going to be less. Mm -hmm. So 188 minus the 125 now I'm down to $63. I see. Okay. Right? Yeah. 
Good use. Now, in many cases, you know, if he's earning two point five on six thousand dollars, right? That that you know, the number could be a little bit higher. Um, and so the cost comes down greatly. So the first month, let's say I pay sixty three. The second month, right? Income goes in, expenses out, cash flow stays. Here's the balance, drops to 15. Average cost, 138 minus 125. Look at that, $13.96. And then by December, I'm no longer paying interest on the line of credit. I am, but I'm not because my cash back rewards offsets that. Correct. So mm -hmm. I have a zero borrowing cost, just like a nice, beautiful, high cash value life insurance policy loan, right? right. Um, any questions on this so far? Is this kind of like? No, no. So I appreciate the breakdown. Um, and I think it's important for anyone that you work with or anyone that decides to work with you to, to be disciplined. So, I mean, you laying out the numbers and it, it goes deeper than this too. I mean, when you actually talk to them, yeah, and have that conversation, how consistent is the cash flow each month? Does it vary? Because when you, you draw out a detailed plan like this, which works wonders, a lot of your clients have, have sung praises because you've gotten them out of debt so fast, but it does require discipline there and following whatever plan that you and your client agrees on. Correct. Yeah. That is huge. Being in alignment, being in total agreement, have to. and then also cutting out all the noise, yep. right? If you listen to me, but then you go tune into Dave Ramsey, you might get your whole mind twisted. You're like, wait a minute, what am I doing, right? So that's why we, we got to really cut out the noise. Who, who am I going to listen to? Who am I going to follow? And I just got to stick to that, that's all. right? Yeah. And, and this is a, you know, just my own little personal testimony here. When I came across Grant Cardone and the whole 10X concept, I listened to nobody else besides Grant. I love Tony Robbins. I love Dean Graciosi. I love all the other guys, mm -hmm. but I only listened to Grant when I was building my business because I was interested in 10 X, how do right. I 10 X go from 2000 to 20,000 a month. Once I did it, then I incorporated a little Tony, a little Dean and uh, you know, other influencers that I like Gary Vaynerchuk and so many other guys and gals out there. Gotcha. Right. But I, I got to build my base first. Yeah. So coming back to the numbers here, look at this. We're from July to October, November, now December. I'm still not talking to this guy about infinite banking. Now he's probably <laughs> watching videos more than happy. You know, hey, watch the videos, get educated, learn the good, the bad, the ugly about yeah. infinite banking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm still not introducing it to him yet. Right. So the line of credit goes up a little bit more in December because he has a credit card that expires. And I think it's this one right here the interest rate would be higher than the 8.9 and the 12.24. So that's why I would go after that Gotcha. just to get rid of that. So that's another hundred bucks I'm gaining. Now here's some other information. And again, this is the reality of people's financial situations is he said, then Zell come January, my mortgage payment's going to kick in. Student loans are going to kick in um, a little couple months after January. Mm -hmm. but my income is going to drop by a thousand dollars. Gotcha. So that is kind of like a kicker that kind of hurts. Sure. That means all the work that I just did with him is going to get minus by a thousand bucks plus all the mortgage payments. Gotcha. So the new estimated numbers going into January, 2021 is income is going to be 10,401.92. Okay. His expenses will be eight thousand. Okay. Six eighty four seventeen, and he'll net about a cash flow between one thousand seven hundred and seventeen dollars seventy five cents, and maybe as high as two k. Okay. Right. And so, with that, we would still do velocity banking because he owes right mm -hmm. on the line of credit. The goal is to bring that to zero. When he brings that to zero. We're going to come back to these debts and see which ones we want to go after next, mm -hmm. right? Now, um, what will be most likely the case is velocity banking may not make sense for this gentleman 
for a temporary period of time. Because so remember I said, look, the next attractive debts are right here, but they're all at zero. What we would do is flip, go to debt snowball, right? And just send extra payments towards these small debts, right? Get 127, get that 323, get that 350, get that 100, you know, get that 200 until we can, what I call, uh, upgrade yep. my debt tool. Very nice. Right? So this is being practical. This is saying, hey, the concept's great, but it may not work for everyone. Or it may work for a temporary period of time. Then we have to shut it off, go back to traditions, right? Because you're going to go faster than velocity banking. So being aware of that, yeah. right? And then having the discipline to say, okay, I'm not ready and that's okay. I'm not <laughs> ready for infinite banking and that's okay. So mm -hmm. I'm probably going to introduce uh, infinite banking to this gentleman once he's paid off like pretty much all of these things right here. When these get canceled out and then the only thing he has left are these high student loans, yeah. that car and the mortgage. The car is interesting. I think it's at a fairly low rate, but it's, it's a super high payment. Yeah. I would be tempted to actually, you know, instead of making a big chunk from a PLOC or a HELOC, I might then want to say, okay, maybe we can do some infinite banking here and be done in a similar time frame. Mm -hmm. So not only am I getting out of debt, but I'm also establishing an asset. Gotcha. So probably by the end of 2021 or summer, right, or maybe fall right is when i would introduce infinite banking after all of these are gone and then this one is gone as well yeah okay and his income goes back up he said it's only going to be for a, a temporary period of time the income's going to drop a little bit i think it's because either he's losing a tenant or I, I forgot what the reason was but he knows it's definitely going to drop by a thousand he's aware of that he's getting results He's happy. We're happy. I'm happy. Right. <laughs> and, you know, so this is like being practical. Say, hey, for a majority of Americans that are watching this video that do not have your finances in order, you know, here are the steps. Mm -hmm. Here are the different, there's a hundred different ways you can go about getting out of debt, 10x your income, right? Yeah. But it's about picking one, being solid in that one direction, being really, really disciplined. And, uh, and really committing, right? It's yeah. like a relationship. You're, you're creating a relationship with your money and you need to know how you behave with your yeah. money. Just like how you behave with your wife when she's angry, when she's happy, when she's sad, right? Or vice versa with your husband when he's angry, when he's happy, when he's sad. Sometimes you get, oh, that doesn't work. Let me buy some roses or let me make dinner or let me clean the house mm -hmm. because he's not having a good day. Yeah. When it's good, it's good. When it's bad, we got to adjust. You got to adjust, adjust. Mm -hmm. You're constantly in change, Yep. right? And so I would just kind of leave everybody with that. Um, any, any questions there? Is that kind of like a, a good starting ground? This also helps the agents, I would say, all the in-house agents that, it does. you know, th this would be a great kind of video. Hey, you know, if they're dealing with someone mm -hmm. that's really in a bind, but hey, watch this. This will really kind of ground you yeah. before I sell you this policy. Uh, fully agree for for any agent out there really because the the hard part for an agent especially if you're new is you want that sale right away Definitely. and yeah cash value life insurance and infinite banking excites people right away when it's set up properly so it's something that can be sold right away and you've got that oh this is so great i'm i'm getting into the industry and taking off right away but then based on someone's situation like if they've got a lot of debt in a case like we just went through or you just went through there, it does make sense to say, all right, well, let's just put the brakes on the policy for a bit, clean up your situation. And then from the agent's perspective, what ends up happening is that individual can now obtain a much larger policy and do a whole lot more with it. And that that really, you're using that as your financing tool then when you've got a means to overfund the policy, build it for cash accumulation have death benefit protection there too, which is great. But then on the cash value side, 
you've got access to that anytime you want to. So now you can use that as a means to borrow, use to pay off debt, and then that will actually come in and model how policy loans work as far as here's a policy when I let it sit and grow, loan, repay, loan, life happens, can't repay, what's the impact on that policy? So you can see it firsthand. Um, but step one is definitely freeing up the cash flow, paying off the debt, because then you've got you've got more cash flow, but you have peace of mind. Uh, that's kind of how I view it. Yeah, you don't have to think and worry about that. And that enables you to go much, much faster. Right. And for the agents watching, especially your agents that mm -hmm. I know will probably watch this video and the content that we're putting together, um, think big because let's say you were working with this client that I just showed you. It's a husband and a wife. Maybe they have a younger son or daughter mm -hmm. that is working and could put a policy in place and they don't have any debt. Maybe they have a mom and a dad that's not too old, right? And still in good health. And maybe they have money that they could put a policy in place. Yeah. Maybe they have coworkers, friends, ask for referrals, right? Especially if you go through this whole thing with that client, instead of wasting your time selling them the concept, you just say, okay, well, let, let's get your numbers. Let's, you know, let's get to know each other a little bit more. Maybe we're not ready now, but I'd be more than happy to help you in six months from now, one year from now, I'm going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're super transparent. And in that year, they may send you three people, yeah. three sales. It adds up. But if you would have, if you would have shooed them away or, you know, you sold them and then they're discouraged or they're not ready. Now you're kind of like, oh man, I you're just spent four guy. hours on this guy. Yeah. <laughs> and you're you know, the bad and, guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. You put them in something they weren't ready for. Yeah. No, fully agree. And this, you're doing the right thing. I mean, that's where it starts. Do the right thing and everything else works out. It's just a basic principle in life. <laughs> just keep doing that um, and stay disciplined, especially with the debt approach. Uh, listen to one person, whatever strategy you have when you mentioned, hey, if you're listening to my strategy or if you look at Dave Ramsey, I mean, he's people have his opinions on him, especially people that sell cash value life insurance. But he right. he is where he is because his strategy works for a lot of people. So rather than just, you know, harp on the guy and say, oh, everything stinks. No, I mean, he's got stuff that legitimately works and that's perfectly fine. Take the good. Okay, that's great. But if you're going to go his strategy and then you want to do Denzel's or anyone else's, like I, mixing them typically doesn't work. You don't take parts from a, a Ferrari and put it into a Ford. And it's not, it's not going to function. It's one or the other. Yeah. I was watching Ford and Ferrari not too long ago. That's probably why that came to my mind. That was a good movie. Yeah, that, that came movie. to my mind as well. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that must have been why. I don't know why. I like cars. <laughs> cool. Well, this was this was great. Thanks so much for your, your time and and going into detail on that. I know this was a would have been a very complex topic, but the visuals hopefully were very helpful um, and just went through it at a nice slow pace. Great job. Um, really appreciate it, Denzel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. God yeah. bless. Absolutely. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.